Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I am David Molko. We begin tonight with heartbreak on the Portland State campus and questions about the murder of Amara Marluk, allegedly at the hands of a college freshman. Tonight, friends and professors are grieving the loss of the 19-year-old student they describe as an activist and an artist, or Alma McCarty, with a look at the impact of Portland's latest homicide on those who knew her. Honoring the life of 19-year-old Amara Marluk. I can't believe I'm talking about her in the past tense. With a growing impromptu memorial on the Portland State University campus. Amara was that person that you could just instantaneously connect to, for sure. Flowers and candles at Southwest College Street and 6th Avenue. The place police say Marluk was gunned down, killed early Monday morning. I lose words because I, I cannot even express what, what I feel in terms of how can you do it? How can you? Bright Alozier, an assistant professor of black studies at PSU, was one of Marluk's teachers. She just did not practice what she believed in. She lived by it. He says as a student, she stood out, passionate about being a voice for change. She was an ex executive at the Black Students Union, and she really wanted to fight genuinely for racial equity, for more inclusion, for, for more diversity. You know, she was dedicated to the cause. Police charged Keenan Harpool with her murder. The 20-year-old freshman and former football player for the school appeared in court Tuesday pleading not guilty. Friends tell KGW the suspect had previously been in a relationship with Marluk. In the courtroom today, Marluk's family shared their pain. It's the mother, a mother's worst nightmare that somebody so evil that would take her life. I'm just so devastated. And they pleaded with the judge to keep Harpole behind bars. She was the light of our life, and we strongly, strongly encourage the court to protect other women who may face similar fates. For now, Harpel will stay in jail as those across campus and across Portland mourn the loss of a young life. Five years from now, who knew what or who Amara could have been? Who knew the kind of impact she would have made? In a video statement, PSU's president also expressed the university's deepest condolences and sympathies to Amara Marluk's family, saying she showed great promise in using arts to share her voice and her compassion for community. And our thoughts tonight with the wider PSU community and her extended family. Alma, thank you. Well, let's take you to day two of the murder trial for the romance novelist Nancy Crampton Brophy accused of killing her husband. A warning again tonight. The details here are disturbing and we begin our coverage with testimony from the student at the Oregon Culinary Institute who found Daniel Brophy's body. He was a chef and instructor there. Clorinda Perez testified she had shown up with some classmates early, had gone to make coffee that morning in June 2018. That is when she saw the kitchen lights on and heard the water running. I checked to see if there was, I could get a response really quick and I didn't. And then I ran to the, to the doorway and just yelled for someone to call 911. Uh, I told the girl that was on the phone with them. Um, because we're, you know, we're taught even if you break a rib, you, you don't stop, you continue compressions. And so I, I thought that's what I had done. Yeah, she thought she'd broken a rib. Perez didn't know it at the time as she performed CPR, but Brophy had been shot twice, once in the back, then a second time in the chest, prosecutors say. Now, we also heard from first responders who testified they arrived within three minutes of that 911 call and within moments realized something was gravely wrong. I moved his left arm to apply the tourniquet to to start the IV when I saw the spin casing roll out. Um, at that point, I stopped the scene and had everybody look for weapons um, because it's highly unusual yeah, to see a, a spent casing. So we did a, a safety check, and as I was doing that, looking around, and everybody was looking around, I noticed a, a second spent casing. 
Now, keep in mind, these are state witnesses. Defense didn't really try to poke any holes in their testimony so much as begin planting small seeds of doubt, asking witnesses about a homeless camp under the bleachers of the neighboring high school. And then someone spotted, they said, going through recycling bins outside the school. So reasonable doubt. Remember the threshold for conviction. The prosecution expected to take about three weeks to present its case, followed by defense, who says Nancy Brophy couldn't have killed her husband because they were in love. That is their argument so far. At some point, we understand she's expected to testify in her own defense. Complete coverage and updates, of course, on air and online over the next few weeks, all at KGW.com. Well, new tonight, we have learned the sheriff of Columbia County was one of the officers who shot at a suspect in Scapoose, killing him. Investigators say the man fired a police first. This was a Grumpy's towing off Highway 30 last Thursday. Now the major crimes team investigating says Sheriff Brian Pixley and Oregon State Police Sergeant Chad Drew were the two who fired their guns. Police say the man shot dead. His name is Michael Stockton, was involved in some sort of disturbance at the tow yard. He was also wanted as a suspect for a murder in Gresham. All right, let's get you caught up on tonight's other headlines. After 40 years, a local Jane Doe finally has a name. The body of the teenager was discovered in Clark County in 1980. Thanks to forensic genealogy, investigators now know her name was Sandra Morden. She disappeared in the late 70s when she was 16. She lived in Vancouver, Portland and Newburgh. Now detectives are hoping the name again, Sandra Morden will spark someone's memory. They want to talk to anyone who knew her or her family so they can figure out what happened. All right, tonight, new tents put up in protest of homeless camp sweeps in Portland have been swept themselves. Advocates constructed the large shelter Sunday in the North Park blocks. This is video from there. They say the city agencies came and cleared them out this morning. Advocates say the sweeps are not the solution. They were only standing up for people living down the street who they say were to, told to leave their camp later this week. And Governor Brown today signed a bill she says will improve the state's workforce. It is called Future Ready Oregon. It includes $200 million in funding for education, training and resources. The focus is on jobs in high paying industries like tech, manufacturing and healthcare. It is also aimed at helping historically underserved communities and that includes people of color, women and those with lower incomes. Well, a local couple is just back after a humanitarian relief trip to Ukraine. They filled suitcases with donations. They traveled to a city that has both a unique connection to Oregon and an outsized role in helping so many who have been displaced. Catherine Cook has their story. From sunflowers under a purple sky to the sun-drenched homes nearby, these paintings embody the beauty of Ushgorod, Ukraine. For Randy and Sabra Killen, it's a city they know well, a sister city to Corvallis, Oregon, where the couple lived for many years. They've traveled there countless times as part of that association, returning with mementos like these. But nothing compares to their most recent trip. You know, it's hard because... Sorry. You see what happens there, and um, they're your friends. Those friends and many others in Ushgorod are now hosting thousands of Ukrainian refugees from war-ravaged cities like Kyiv. Ushgorod, which borders Slovakia and Hungary, is a safe place. Refugees can rest there for several days before resettling in nearby countries. It's overcrowded. There's people everywhere. We were immediately thinking about all the people we know there and what can we do to help them. The Killens learned medicine was in short supply and medical equipment like stethoscopes. So they collected donations, enough to fill 10 suitcases and flew to Ukraine to deliver it. They say refugees were thankful and curious. They're like, does America know what's happening to us? So that was sad to hear them ask that question. After sharing those supplies, the Killen spent 10 days buying and delivering things like refrigerators, microwaves, and mattresses. They say the dorms in Ujgorod, where refugees are staying, are often empty. It's hard to hear their stories because they've lost everything that they have. And how do you recover from that? The Killen say one answer is the generosity of others. To buy everything, they used donations, more than $200,000 worth, raised by the Corvallis Sister City Association and a Citizens Bank Fund. There's a lot of good charities that are working with the individuals in Ukraine. Maybe it gives them some hope. 
Volunteers with the Corvallis Sister Cities Association are planning another humanitarian relief trip to Ujgrad in the near future. If you'd like to help donate toward that effort, we'll post a link for you on KGW.com. Catherine Cook, KGW News. One family, one suitcase at a time. Great to see. A reminder for drivers to slow down or pay up. Peabot has installed Portland's first intersection safety camera, and that means citations for both speeding and running red lights. The first one is now up and running. It's at Southie Stark and 122nd. Peabot says that area tops Portland's list of high crash corridors. The camera is being tested this week, and for the first month, drivers are going to get a warning instead of a ticket, but you have been warned citations start on May 11th.